conceptually, the district attorneys of this state support House Bill 1 in some of its goals. It's those goals that we do support are the, the unification of various laws into one combined body of law. The other is that we support is the idea of transparency in the use and reporting of seizure and forfeiture money. And the third thing that we support is the idea of accountability. Although, as I said at a previous hearing, we are somewhat concerned. And we understand the, the chair's dilemma or the author's dilemma, and we are somewhat concerned about the role of the district attorney in enforcing that accountability because our concern is that um, we really have no power over other elected officials and, and sanction uh, the ability to sanction other elected officials. So there are some mechanics in there that we're concerned about, but not the concept. But I want to say, on behalf of the I district attorney, around the other room, not even here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want I want to say, on behalf of the district attorneys of Georgia, that unequivocally and without a doubt, I want to make clear that we are against the passage of House Bill One. And there are three things that I'd like to focus on <coughs> as the basis of our opposition. And the first begins with what we perceive as misconceptions in the origin of the bill. And, and those two misconceptions, first of all, begin with almost a presumption of wrongdoing on the part of law enforcement that we rebut, that we do not believe <coughs> is true. Um, Mr. Chairman, you have referred to incidents that have, that have come to your attention, and, and while we are deeply concerned about incidents of wrongdoing, we do not believe that, as a whole, the law enforcement community in this state is guilty of the wrongdoings that are in, that are set out in certain publications by other by other groups. Um, in general, we believe that forfeiture proceedings are or forfeiture forfeiture proceeds are used properly, that people are given due process, and that people are given the opportunity to have a hearing, and if they are an innocent owner, to have that property returned. The other misconception that I believe is, is uh, widespread is that in Georgia there is somehow a misconception that a person's property can be taken away without judicial process, and that is simply not true. Under 161349, the state cannot forfeit or seize any property without receiving <coughs> from a court based upon a hearing where the state proves by a preponderance of evidence that the, the, the proceeds or the property to be seized were either used to facilitate the commission of a crime or were proceeds from the commission of a crime. Focusing on the specifics of the bill, one of the, one of the main concerns that prosecutors in this state have is the changing of the burden of proof from a proof by a preponderance of the evidence to proof by clear and convincing evidence. And, and Mr. Chairman, you and I, I guess, will have to agree to disagree, but I would state to the committee that 37 states use either a preponderance of the evidence standard or a lower standard. In some states, property can be seized actually on a probable cause standard, but 37 states use the preponderance of evidence or lower standard, and the federal government uses the preponderance of evidence. And we believe that's because forfeiture has been held by the United States Supreme Court and by the Supreme Court of this state not to be punitive in nature, but to be remedial. And so it falls in the category of civil damages. And so to make the statement that to raise the burden of proof will not change the state's ability to seize property seems to me to be logically uh, incorrect. And I would just say to those of you who are attorneys that if all of a sudden you were asked to prove damages in a civil case by a preponderance of the evidence, or excuse me, by clear and convincing evidence rather than by a preponderance of the evidence, I would submit that you would be seeking damages less often. And that's one of the concerns that we have is that by raising this, the standard of proof in these remedial actions, you will reduce the filing of state forfeiture. The second thing that the district attorneys are, are concerned about is the reduction of the threshold of, of the sufficiency of a claim. And what, <coughs> what the proposed legislation says is that the sufficiency of a claim will be by delivering in writing to the district attorney's office certain information by the claimant. 
It does away with requirements in the current law. For instance, if you have a property or a security interest in property, current law requires that be a perfected security interest. In other words, a filed security interest. So the bill as written leads to the situation where I could loan, so, I could loan someone $500 on a car. I could not take a note because he's my friend. And if the, that person then uses the car illegally, I could file a claim without having to have any proof of that claim. Now, that, that's a good thing for claimants, but it's a bad thing for lawyers because it's being represented by, by certain uh, members of the defense bar that this will actually reduce discovery. Now, those of you who are lawyers know that probably the worst thing that can happen to you is to be embarrassed in a courtroom. I don't think there's many other things that I hate worse than that. And I can tell you if a claim that I am suspicious of does not or does not on its face establish an interest, then I'm going to ask for discovery. And the bill provides that if either side asks for discovery, the court can, ask, can, can give discovery. I'm going to ask and I'm going to do depositions and I'm going to do requests for admissions and I'm going to do interrogatories. And instead of expediting the process, it will lengthen. And so we submit that by reducing the threshold for a claimant's ability to make his claim as a, as a as a as an innocent owner, you will actually slow the process rather than expedite. In close, in close, on behalf of the district attorneys, I think since our last hearing, Mr. Chairman, I've been thinking about this. And one of the things that the Institute for Justice and all, all of the advocates for forfeiture uh, reform advocate is a change in federal forfeiture law. What I'm concerned about by HB1, and, and again, I repeat, the state is just as concerned about these forfeiture abuses if they exist as anyone in this room. But what I'm concerned about, and 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 evidence shows that if we change state forfeiture law, we're going to force forfeitures into the federal realm where there is no local accountability. There is no uh, ability for the sheriff who's answerable to the voters. There is no ability for the district attorney who is, an who is answerable to the voters to control that process. And we see that happening in those states where these increased standards of proof are being imposed upon law enforcement. And that's one of the main concerns that I have. And I'll be happy to answer any questions, but for those reasons, and the reasons we've stated in previous hearings, the district attorneys are here to oppose the passage of House Bill. All right. Thank you. Mr. Porter, any questions of Mr. Porter? Let me ask you to follow up on this. Not a philosophical question, but uh, a practical question. Once a property goes through forfeiture, whether it be tangible property or the intangible being cash, does it become public property? Yes, sir. It, it, it becomes the property of the state or of the local governing jurisdiction. And, and as such, being now converted from an individual property to public property, should there not be a, appropriate accountability of what is done with that property by those who take possession of it. I don't think there's any doubt of that. And, and I would say that, that I, my county has reporting systems in place internally and audit systems in place. And, and I would say that every county should have that. And I would not disagree with that proposition. Thank you. 